Looks like it's working this time. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Feed My Sheep Earthquake Reports and more. I'm Terry Rempel. It's the 27th of July. We've just had a re rehearsal and a half of doing this show. Um, so let's see if we can get through it this time. Um, we're having a good hard look at California risk areas today. Um, we're going to do a more in-depth program later showing the science of why this is all happening and it's going to uh, uh, be challenging what all the experts are saying. Uh, so so-called experts. Uh, before we begin, all of our programs are dedicated to our Heavenly Father and we'll begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for continuing to protect this program. We give you all the glory and we thank you for all that you draw here to watch this. And we um, pray for continued understanding. Jesus, we thank you for all you've led us to. And Holy Spirit, the understanding you bring is, is amazing. And we pray that we, uh, we are the light on the hill that that shines for people. Uh, these are times of trouble. And if we are to read Psalm 91, other promises in the, in the Bible, Ephesians 8, um, we have armor. We have your wings to, uh, to shelter under. Um, we're given authority, uh, believers' authority over forces of Satan. And we thank you for all of these promises. Um, we thank you that uh, we can go forward forward in strength um, with faith over fear. In these times, we thank you, Jesus, um, for your sacrifice and pray that all this shaking, which you've designed, which you, which you allow, shaking of finances, the shaking politically, the shaking um, of uh, food and health, all these different types of shaking um, draw people to look harder at, at truth and for truth and in truth that they find you and find salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are not to fear, and what I'm going to show you may cause some fear, but uh, we are not to have any fear. Um, we are promised great blessings and provisions through God, so let's focus on that as we go through these seismograms. And we're beginning um, in the Salton Sea area. There's a number of, uh, in the Salton Sea Basin, there's a number of uh, seismograms that have gotten much, much busier over time. Um, one of these is the Desert Research Extended Center, and this is in the southwestern part of the um, basin south of Salton Sea. So let's have a look at that. And there it is. And this is, uh, since 2019, this is about quadrupled in, uh, in amount. So we've seen uh, dramatic changes since um, the Ridgecrest earthquake in 2019. That has, uh, we've had dramatic increases in Southern California specifically. We had uh, major changes occur in Northern California beginning um, after the earthquake, the seven, what I assessed as a 7.0 south of Ferndale. Um, and there was multiple earthquakes, there was clusters, and those went on for days, um, swarms of earthquakes, actually. Uh, and we that was a subduction event, and subduction has traveled all down the coast since then. And so uh, that's what we're going to get into the next in the next program, the, the science, the why we have subduction in California. Yes, we have subduction in California and we have much higher risks as a result. So that's what we're going to get into in the next program. But this program, we're going to focus on the risks. And here we are, not a lot of risk around the Desert Research Extended Center because very few people live there or work there. But uh, for those that do work there, um, that is a risk. And those, those people that live in the area of Salton Sea, I know it's sparsely populated, but uh, it's important that everybody know the risks of their area. This is El Centro, south of Salton Sea, near the border, on a uh, little more to the, uh, to the east. And this is an average day at El Centro. This site was put in uh, earlier this year, and it's been active ever since it was uh, installed. 
This is from Imperial on the 20th. Imperial, the uh, seismogram site was here back in 2019. And we've watched the activity grow dramatically in Imperial. Um, we had a little bit of this type of activity showing up. Uh, and it was mainly, and the baseline was not nearly so elevated. So we've had uh, five, six times increase at uh, Imperial since we started watching this site. Um, in fact, it's, it's probably more like 10 times, but um, I can't quantify that unless, but, but you can. You can go back and look at some of the earliest programs that we did, uh, go to videos and go back in time, and you can look at some of the earliest programs that we did. Watch one of those on California and see the changes that have occurred and what there is now, because you'll, you'll be amazed at some of the differences. This is closer to the Salton Sea at Westmoreland. The activity is less pronounced, but very significant. So a long period, pulses of magma infill through here. And here we're at Bombay Beach, which is on the uh, eastern side of Salton Sea, about midway along. And you see these large pulses of magma infill. We're very close to where the magma is coming in at this site in the most pronounced location. Um, so we see a lot of these squared off clipped wave signals, right? The, the signals are clipped by the uh, seismology system that produces the seismogram. It only lets the signals get just so big and it cuts off the tops of these. And you get smaller signals as well. That's what the signal would look like amplified at a larger size if it was here. And this is uh, this is only has a little bit of clipping there and there. So you can see what the signal is normally. It's just altered by the clipping process. So lots of tremors on the baseline at that site as well. Now we're following the San Andreas north of Salton Sea at Mirage. And I just wanted to show you these long, besides all the tremors and the elevated baseline signal. Um, so there's a tremor and there's a tremor, there's a tremor, there's you know tremors all through here. We have these long period signals in here. And these match up what we get at Salton Sea. We're now north of Salton Sea, but we're on the same fault system, um, which is the San Andreas. And the San Andreas carries on right down to the Gulf of California. It just changes names. It's like roads changing names on a bend or because there's a lake nearby. They now call it Lakeshore Road, even though it was Mountain View Road before that or whatever. It's the same same fault all the way down to the Gulf of California. And this is that same fault, the San Andreas. And it's showing these are magma signals. And this establishes that there's a magma channel um, mixed into the San Andreas Fault. It's infiltrated. The, the magma's come up. It's found a weak area. And it's flowing through that weak area in a pulsating manner. And these are pulses of magma movement through a magma channel north of Salton Sea at Mirage. That's my interpretation of that site. When we go down to the southeast corner of Salton Sea, we saw, see a more pronounced version of the same thing. Long period magma signal. So we can do comparative analysis between the magma that's at Salton Sea, and we know there's near surface magma there, and we can compare these this to other sites. So these are long period magma infill signals. And here we're seeing a larger pulse. This is a larger pulse. But when you're looking from the side, you're not directly over top of the magma channel. The signal is not as pronounced. It's not clipped off. And you get a longer, flatter waveform. So lots of tremors mixed in there. Worcester Waterfall site, that's a relatively new site this year. They've added, uh, I think, three new sites south of Salton Sea. So they know something's going on there, um, and they're trying to keep track of it. If they're adding sites, a number of sites, to uh, an area in a, in a year because they're expensive to add, um, and they take time to track and everything, they add workload, uh, they don't do it without a reason. Now, this is the Frink site. This is to the west of Salton, or to the east of uh, Bombay Beach at Salton Sea. And we can see those same flattened signals. This is through USGS. The other one's a Southern California organization, Caltech. So back to the Caltech seismograms, and this is Beaumont. This is our next stop going up the San Andreas, uh, north on the San Andreas. And the activity here has grown rapidly over the last three months. Um, so this is a big change at Beaumont. Um, 
And that's on the way, and we expect that's including magma signals. If we, whoops, sorry, blow this up, we can see a long period pulse through here, elevated long period pulse through here. We're not as directly over the magma channel, but there's magma channel type activity at this site, plus lots of tremors. And when we go north to San Bernardino, it's a wow site. This is a wow site. How much this has increased in the last, just the last few weeks is quite incredible. And uh, this is every day. It backs off at night. Most of the magma signals in California do back off at night. So we have less of them. There's a stimulation of having the sun come around and uh, face the crust as well. Um, more of an exchange of energy and uh, volcanics become more active in the daylight hours in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases. So we see this pattern is very active and it's every day in San Bernardino now um, that it's like this or close to this. And uh, if it was tectonic activity, you'd have uh, mag you'd have uh, cracks opening up and uh, buildings leaning and all kinds of issues with ground deformation. Um, and because we don't have the ground deformation associated with this type of signal, it can only be magma that's causing this. And this is not an over amplitude site. I've watched this site for years. This is developing magma flow in a fault and the fault is the San Andreas. And so we've got uh, more than tectonic going on with the San Andreas. Um, now, there seems to be an activity split at San Bernardino, and the ma main magma flow seems to go east towards Pasadena. And so we're going to work our way east, and we're going to look at those uh, risk areas. So we're looking at the high-risk areas where the population is as a priority. And uh, this is um, Mira Loma, the next... Um, named area on the way um, towards Pasadena. And this has a lot of baseline activity as well. It also has, this I expect is a fault shift. We're getting fault shifts through here as well. And I don't know the faults through this area, um, but I expect there are faults through this area because there's always faults paralleling mountains and we're paralleling, I believe it's the San Gabriel Mountains here as we go across to the, uh, to the west. Lots of activity here, and this is continuing to increase. This did not used to be nearly this busy. It wasn't until um, a big shift after the Ridgecrest earthquakes um, that we had all these uh, sites developing so much activity, and there's uh, this is cause and effect. Um, and uh, the the Ridgecrest earthquakes, uh, there was. In, in looking back, and I looked today, there was, I think, a 5.5, a 6.4, a 7.1. But that 7.1 was initially reported as a 7.5, and it uh, caused, uh, I think the damage estimate was $5.3 billion in damage in an outlying area that didn't have a, a high density of population or large amounts of infrastructure. So that's a tremendous um, valuation of damage, 5.3 million, and you don't get that with a 7.1. You get that with a 7.8 or larger, and that's where I'm putting that earthquake at. That largest er Ridgecrest earthquake had to be about a 7.8, and it displaced the Garlock Fault, a previous, a very large, previously unknown fault that runs perpendicular to the coastline and the main fault trends in California. So why did that fault get displaced? because we had a different type of force being applied. The force was east-west, and that matches up with continental drift as the primary cause of that fault, shifting. The major shift of that fault was caused by east-west force application, and uh, that's not what you get with the San Andreas moving. San Andreas is following the coastline. It's a... Uh, um, East southeast to or south southeast to north northwest um, is the force that is applied to the San Andreas that causes it to shift. So this is a perpendicular force that overcame and exposed the Garlock Fault. Garlock fault. Now Chino, Chino is uh, the next one moving to the west. Very very active site. 
this is showing a lot of activity and this is an awful lot like Moore Park. We're going to look at Moore Park too as, as part of this, I believe. Um, very active site. We continue west. We're at the La Puente site. This has signals very much like Bombay Beach, clipped wave signals, long period magma infill signals, smaller, but this has a lot more baseline tremors. This is actually more active than the Salton Sea, and it has been for years now. The Rush site is a recent flare-up of activity. This is in the valley uh, west of uh, La Puente. And uh, this is the Rush substation, the electrical substation there. And this site is uh, not normally, doesn't normally have all these tremors. It has a lot of baseline activity, elevated baseline activity, but these large tremors is, is quite a dramatic increase. And that's on the 25th, a couple of days ago. And uh, Rio Hondo, what a surprise this one is in, in how active it has become. Um, this, uh, this just is uh, a dramatic increase. And this is, uh, by the constancy of the signal, that's magma flow. And apparently there's an associated river channel in the Rio Hondo area. Um, Pasadena, I believe this site is quite over amplitude uh, three to four times maybe over amplitude but the activity is real the activity is heavy on either side of Pasadena so there's a lot of activity in Pasadena but it's being presented in an over amplitude manner and when I initially looked at this when it was just wavy baselines it would be wavy baselines it was wavy every day it was over amplitude every day but um we didn't have anything near this level of activity and this has developed it just in the last uh, six months or so. So big change in the past six months. Now if we jump up to the uh, uh, Mojave Desert, um, Victorville area, I think we're about 30 miles north of the mountain range and, and the associated faults there, the San Andreas. Um, we've got an unusual signal here. It's a lower frequency than a uh, typical earthquake signal. I'm guessing that it's man-made. I don't know why or what is causing this. And uh, so very active site in uh, Atalanto, which is, uh, I'm not sure if it's a suburb of Victorville or its own town, um, but it's, it's a residential and business area up there. If we uh, parallel the San Gabriel Mountains westward, but we stay north, uh, we see an activity trend that remains about 20 to 30 miles north of the San Andreas. And Wilsona is part of this. This is Wilsona. Lots of tremors. These all look to be tectonic. We don't have that elevated baseline all the way through as we do with magma. So this all looks tectonic and there's near associated faults. Now we don't know um, what fault would be fault trend there's perhaps unknown faults in the Mojave Desert and there seems to be one that parallels the San Andreas north of it paralleling the uh, San Andreas and I think it's the San Gabriel Mountains there if we continue on that trend we get to the and heading west uh, which is kind of west northwest we get to the Fox Airport west of Lancaster and uh, lots of tremors at that location as well. There has been for years. Ninach has an extraordinary amount of tremors. So I think we're uh, pretty much right over the, uh, the, uh, the fault that's associated with all of these tremors that we're seeing at, um, at Fox Airport and at Wil Wilsona. And we see some uh, little VLF waves through here as well. VLF waves associated with fault shift. Um, this activity, I'm not sure if uh, if it's related. This is the Thule Elk Preserve southeast of Bakersfield. Um, and it's probably just related with the uh, loss of ground height that we're seeing in the area related to all the uh, water and oil extraction in the areas around Bakersfield. Now, there's a few other very active sites, fairly active and very active in Southern California. This is Hidden Hills north of L.A. And we get this. This was uh, yesterday evening, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, we get these periods of very high activity, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what's causing this. This is a very unusual signal type. 
And those, uh, those are every few days that we get those, sometimes multiple days in a row. North Hollywood and Rinaldi are both pretty active, and this is Rinaldi. So heading up towards the San Fernando Valley. When we get to the San Fernando Valley up the north end at the apex, we're, uh, we're at Part E, and, uh, Part E substation, I believe, and uh, this is extremely active uh, for that site as well, much like um, um, uh, the Miraloma site and uh, Moore Park. This is the Bell Gardens area of East L.A., Bell Gardens. So that's eastern, uh, eastern Los Angeles. This is Del Amo. We're east of Long Beach. This is a lot of activity, and this is common every day, um, Del Amo. So we believe there's an eastward running magma channel associated with this one, east from the Long Beach site at uh, State Street or, or the associated fault. Um, the fault that's associated with the State Street site that comes out of Long Beach. This is northeast of Huntington Beach. Northeast of Huntington Beach. A very active site, uh, many, quite often like this during the day. Sometimes it backs off to uh, half of this, but it's still, it's always active. And Santiago to the south of Irvine shows a recent significant increase. The tremor levels are much increased from what they normally are here. Normally they're up there like this. This is a, about a 10 times increase. That's on the, uh, that's on the 26th yesterday. The worst risks for all of Southern California um, are associated with the tank farms and, uh, and refineries. Uh, this is just north of Long Beach in the heart of tank farms and refineries. And this, I believe, is a magma channel that runs in an ancient riverbed that uh, comes out of uh, Long Beach. So that's all been concreted in. The river's still there. It's all concreted in, though. And there's very little flow that gets out, uh, except during very heavy rains now. So I'm not sure if it's the L.A. River. Anyway, just north of their uh, light hype at Artesia Boulevard, um, an extension of that same fault, I believe. Same type of activity, magma channel within the fault. Now, the fault, that fault is going to be some... Um, seven to eight miles, maybe nine miles deep, the depth of the crust. It runs the full depth of the crust. And it's not that the magma channel fills the whole fault. It's not going to be miles and miles thick. But a magma channel 16 feet in diameter is not unusual. We have those that you can walk through in eastern Oregon. So uh, lava tubes in eastern Oregon are available that people can go in. There's, there's lots of them. There's, uh, there's quite a few. There's uh, a good half dozen anyway that are public, well-known publicly. And this is, uh, and uh, the light hype substation is uh, in an area of tank farms, and that's why I wanted to show it there. If, if, uh, if this is indeed magma running in faults, and uh, that magma breaks out of the channel, which is some depth, underneath, we don't know how far down it is, and gets into these tank farms. I mean, that could be such a conflagration of fire, such a firestorm in L.A., um, the likes of which are, you know, think back to the Second World War fire bombings, and that's what you'd be looking at. Playa del Rey, also near a tank farm, um, not nearly as active, but the fact that it's near a tank farm um, raises uh, concerns. And these tank farms are basically sitting on... Uh, uh, deposit, deposited estuary sediments. They're on unstable ground. So that's, that's not good either. If you get an earthquake and you get unstable ground, whether you get, uh, have magma coming up through them or not, you're going to have uh, these tank farms tipping over or, or rupturing um, with the shaking uh, because liquefaction of estuary um, sediments is going to shake these tanks uh, 10 times harder than the actual earthquake. And, um, and that's, that's what you get. You could easily get a 10 times magnification in an area of liquefaction. So if you imagine you get, uh, let's say, an 8.0 earthquake in L.A., 
well, this is going to get hit with a nine. That's certainly going to cause some major, major issues with tanks and refineries getting hit with a nine. They're not designed for that level of earthquakes. All right, so if you want to see why this is all happening, we're going to have another in-depth program that's going to show just exactly that. These are the risks of California, and they are um, just increasing. They're, they're uh, outrageous, really, and they're increasing. Um, I don't know how long LA is going to remain stable as this activity has been increasing for four years now. And at some point it's going to get out of hand um, and uh, something is going to uh, uh, erupt or shift very, very hard. Now I expect with all the subduction and we're, we're what we're saying and the evidence will show on the next program is program is that California is experiencing subduction associated with the Cascadia as an extension of the Cascadia. And we'll get into the science of that in the next program. And a longer subduction earthquake is a harder hitting subduction earthquake. So if we add all of California south of Petrolia to the Cascadia earthquake, and it starts at the north end, as Chris Goldfinger says, um, then we're going in for a whopper in California. Um, I expect there are going to be precursor earthquakes. I expect that the uh, Ridgecrest earthquake was a precursor. I expect that the... Uh, South of Ferndale earthquake, the 7.0, as I assessed it, uh, was a precursor. I expect that we're going to get precursors up into the 8.0, maybe 8.5 range in California, and they still won't be the biggest earthquake to come. What I'm expecting is we'll have shocks that are greatly damaging, and people will say, oh, that's the big one we were expecting. And instead, what's going to happen is the Great Cascadia is going to follow it after the precursor earthquakes in California. And then it'll be devastating. And that, that, uh, that will be a great, great hardship for very many. So if you get a precursor, something in the 8.0 range, I don't think that's done for California. I think that's just the final warning before California is in real bad shape, rocked hard as part of the Cascadia when it lets go. When that's going to, going to occur, I can't predict. I don't know. But I can say that everything is advancing. And you need to pray about this. You need to pray about your situation. You need to seek the will of God. Because God's hand is over all things in our lives. And uh, this isn't a time for fear, but to, a time to draw near and, um, and develop faith. Develop faith through study, through prayer. Draw close. And if you do that, you're going to be spiritually prepared for whatever comes. It's not enough to prepare physically, and few are going to be able to prepare physically for what comes for California. It's, uh, it's, it's a big deal, and most aren't willing to put in the effort. Um, this is quite survivable, but you've got to be well prepared in order to do so and you've got to be properly situated, and you've got to have um, the hand of God over you in most cases. All right, so we'll see you next time on the next program. Um, I'm sorry to show you um, such a dire um, mix of seismograms. Things are really looking quite bad for Southern California and not much better for Northern California. Um, and I'm sorry to report that, but we're looking at an increase in activity all through the Cascade Range as well. So uh, I'm not out of that myself because I'm up at the north end. And so is Esther, of course. And we'll see you next time on Feed My Sheep for our in-depth program. Um, go with God's blessings and bye for now. <music>